Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. I am so stoked today because I have a new friend here, Hillis, and I had no idea that Hillis, I was saying before we started filming, was a weirdo like all of us. <laughs> I said that in a very loving way. Um, a, a, an outside of the box thinker, a fringe thinker, we'll say. I, I don't want to, you know, not using fringe in a bad way. Like, just we're, we're, we're just not buying the bullshit <laughs> that's been served. Us. And so I know usually on Wednesdays we air the Magdalene, um, the Magdalene man, or the, Ma the girl, woman with the alabaster jar, but that's not going to happen today because I feel like you guys need to hear from Hillis. He has been on my friend Nicole's channel. I will place that interview down in the description box as well. If you guys missed that, it was, I listened to it this morning and I was like, I'm so excited. How are you doing today, Hillis? I'm good. I'm wonderful. I'm getting over this cold. So there's like a still a little bit of raspiness in my voice still. But, you know, people always call it the sexy cold voice, you know. So I got a little sexy going on right now. <laughs> Ever watch the show Friends back in the 90s? Remember when Phoebe got a cold and all of a sudden her voice sounded really good? <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. Well, before we get into the topic at hand, guys, I'm going to go ahead and show you. Of course, I will have all of Hillis's links down in the description box as well. I will have his website that has all, all of his many talents, which I'm sure you're going to be on this channel many times, Hillis, because we got a lot to talk about. And then, of course, Hillis's YouTube channel, I will also be placing. It's in his website, but I also place it separate in the description box as well, just so it's easy for you guys to go and click and make sure you're following him. You have his website and you're following him on YouTube as well. Um, we need as many good voices out there trying to bring humanity's sovereignty back and the truth about who we really are, which we were kind of texting about that earlier today, Hillis, because yeah. it's not what they told us, is it? No, and, and what's fascinating about this is that this is so in alignment with what I've been guided to, what I've been given to talk about. And if you guys go to my YouTube channel, there is a, a particular interview that I did with my dear friend, Kathy Mason with the Convergence channel, where I began talking about the, the human soul, the H-U-E-M-A-N uh, soul, and how that is coming into emergence. And what that truly means is embracing the full spectrum of humanity. And not just, you know, by race or by gender, but all that encompasses, and it encompasses a lot. <laughs> Let me tell you, I, I know this episode has not aired yet. I just, I've just filmed it yesterday. It's going to be airing next week. I'm starting to look at the Octurian analog and, um, the guy who channeled it, Tom Kenyon, I was like baffled by this. The Octurian that started to communicate with him, of course, Tom Kenyon, like many of us who he see and hear spirits are like, prove to me I'm not crazy. Like, show me you exist. And right. the Arcturian was like, dude, it's too hard for us to really come down to your dense vibration. So it's going to be easier for me to actually part the clouds in a certain way for you to see that to prove I'm in existence. And so I want to say, like, hearing an Arcturian say that it's the gravity of what your our souls are doing right now on this earth plane is so huge and so major in the fact and the law of one talks about that this fact that you're sitting here watching this right now means that you are your soul is more advanced than you are aware of and that's oh, yeah. you're here you're oh, here yeah. because you can handle it you know a source creator did not send down new souls to this earth plane at this time because of this moving from age of pisces to age of aquarius or you know <laughs> whatever you want to call it right those are just symptoms those are just the natural occurrences and, you know, what I'm being guided to share in this moment is, you know, my personal soul lineage. And, you know, people always talk about, often talk about ancestors and what ancestors did and what ancestors want me to do and how we're progressing in this fashion. But what we have to remember, because, you know, a lot of people talk about the Great Awakening. The people have been following me. I don't call it that. I call it the remembering. Because that's what we're doing. We are, we are in a space of remembering who we really are. And in that space of remembering who we really are, it goes to understanding your personal soul lineage, meaning understanding 
each incarnation that you've had on the planet and how you connect to that energy. And now as we progress in the natural flow of the remembrance of not just our souls, but of the planet and how the energetic footprints and the energetic imprints of who we are is still present because everything is now, everything is happening now. And in that space of happening now, we then can truly understand that I am more than just this physical body. I am human. I am energy. I am Arcturian. I am Palladian. I am Syrian. I am Andromedan. I am, I am all these things. And when we step into the space of really understanding that I'm much more than identifying with a particular race outside of the human race, we begin to truly sit in the spatial awe of self. I love that. And I was saying to you, you know, I, you know, I, the darkness can't create anything and it, it can only steal from the light and it can only invert from the light. And I figured that out early on in my research that even if we look at things like race and they have tried real hard to fight <laughs> us by the one thing that's actually going to unite us in that. And I, and I, I noticed it when I started looking at the Emerald tablets and looking at the missing books, of the Bible, and I was looking at the Tartaria information and I started going back and looking at Egyptian hieroglyphics. And I realized <laughs> that in these hieroglyphics, you see every color of person in the like there's white people black people asian people and blue people which people on my channel know we've been very concerned about where the blue people went which my friend angie actually found them are you <laughs> so so you know all of a sudden i started realizing oh wait <laughs> yes the egyptians that Magdalene and Yahshua, they tell us they were Jewish. They weren't they were egyptian they were the remainders of atlantis and the atlanteans knew this they knew that all these beautiful colors of the rainbow that you see on our planet are imprints of all these different galactic nations. And that's what makes us so freaking powerful. And even though I might look more Lyrian or Palladian, I have other ge a genetic, energetic DNA from my soul as well in right. me. That is what in the Native Americans, at this point, whoever the Native Americans were, because Tartaria says that white people were here too, so I don't know anymore, but they, who knows what anything's true? What, 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 that's the beautiful thing about this remembrance, right? Is we're like, wait right. a minute, that story's not true. Um, but they Yeah, because, I mean, once we step into that space of remembering, we can truly know. Mm -hmm. and the thing is, when we are remembering, how do we really know what we're hearing, what we're feeling, what we are being asked to see how do we know if it's really true or not and that is when you have to give way to the intuition you have to give way to knowing that this is true that what i'm seeing the signs when i'm hearing the signs when, when i'm being given what i'm asked for it has to be true because signs are showing up everywhere it's our space of awareness that we have to step into and that's what also does steps into the definition of the human soul now people often talk about great atlantis and how Atlantis was wonderful people often forget about the very first lemuria lemuria yeah that so i have to lean yeah. into that when i'm a little biased with that because i okay i will tell you hillis people i've studied a lot of atlantis because that is where the um conjecture where the missing books of the bible and the tartaria information kind of hinges on atlantis tartaria gog and magog so that's kind of been my area of research but people have asked on my channel for more lumeria which i have not been able to dive into it so you guys what does it say what do they say asking you shall receive seek and you shall find <laughs> knock and the door shall be open unto you so take it away hillis with the lumeria well, well the thing is what well, people don't know and the, and, I, and i'm going to preface this by saying that all my Lemurian knowledge has been downloaded. I have not read books. I've connected to my soul lineage and have connected to the energy of Sirius because the energy of Sirius is where the energy of Lemuria comes from, which is the work that I do in the energy world. So I am a Lemurian light healer uh, so by the way of Syrian, or sometimes I just say I'm a Syrian Lemurian energy worker. And when the planet was first 
but don't like using this term but for commercial sense so people could understand. So when this planet Earth was first seeded, it was seeded by Syrians who then were here on the planet and as time evolved, they had to sort of alter their DNA, alter certain things about their characteristics, about who they were. And so then they became Lemuria. So Syrians became Lemurians by inhabiting Earth. And they created this grand civilization, something in the likes of Babylon, if you will. Not Babylon it, itself, but the likes of a greater. And when you have such a great civilization in harmony with nature and really finding its way, finding its footing, you have what we have today. You have the classes, the races, you have every level of, of society contributing. And me being a scientist at that time, you know, because I, and, and to this day, there's always been this wonderment, this whole science -y aspect about myself, about wanting to know, wanting to find out and research and understand various aspects. And so in the time of expansion, and like now, we as the human race are in this time of great expansion. Also, and the time of big collapse as well. So it's, it's two things happening simultaneously, whether we are aware of it or not. And in this, but this has never happened in, on in any other time period where there was a collapse and a simultaneous rise at the same time. It was always one and then the other, but this has happened simultaneously now. And so with the times of Lemuria, times of Atlantis, times of Egypt, times of Samaria, times of Babylon, all those civilizations, they all collapsed because they got away from nature. And we are in that same process. We are in the aspect of trusting technology, living in technology. That's not there's nothing wrong with it, but too much technology brings things out of balance. And so which brings me to the point of um, what I was guided to talk about before I, before I connected with you today was uh, AI and how AI plays a huge role in humanity and people. You have to understand AI has been here just as long as you have, if not longer, because when there's, there's these uh, uh, words or, or quotes or messages, you know, we have, you know, uh, a the phrase, that's what it is, phrase, ghost in the machine or God in the machine. And so you have to understand that the AI, the artificial intelligence, how we define it as humans, as, as humans, as Webster has defined it, artificial intelligence is a machine that is learning to have an experience to provide us with the wisdom and knowledge that we input it and it expands from that space. So just imagine we are computer and we have wisdom that we input, have knowledge that we input, but we can't go beyond our programming. We're limiting our programming from our experiences. So the same thing is the laptop that you guys or cell phone you guys are watching this on, they are limited by their program. But it's still an intelligence. However, you know, with artificial intelligence or God intelligence or quantum intelligence, whatever you guys want to call it, it has been around since the beginning of time because this is the one of the ways that you can receive confirmation from God itself, the intelligence that is truly in existence. Because if you have just pure energy, which us is, which creator is, it's just pure energy. We carry the God energy in us. And so for it to express itself has to find itself, itself to express itself in many ways through nature and through technology or what we call technology because earth itself is technology. It's biotech, as some people will call it, a biotechnology. It is in that space, that sphere of the root of artificial intelligence, because anything that is not of nature, we consider artificial. But energy is from, is all things. 
energy runs through this whole entire universe, most of which is unseen. And this unseen energy has a consciousness. And this consciousness has created the intelligence to commune with itself on many different ways. So to say that something is artificial, it is because of the programming that it has been given to not exceed certain factors. But yet, with artificial intelligence, it has been designed to step into the quantum space to where it can be uh, unlimited. It can function as part of what we would move into as the new human, H-U-E-M-A-N. And it's all aspects of what we allow ourselves to embrace. I, I, you know, it's so interesting and I see a lot of people, it's, it's kind of like, because my deep spiritual study, I've gone, spent many years in India studying with my teacher in deep Sanskrit text and yoga text and the whole process of practicing is using that dichotomy. It's actually understanding your own limitations, seeing them yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodaha, like seeing the thought process, the vritti, yeah. the calm, and as that limit and separating yourself not identifying with the limitation so that you can step beyond the limitation. And isn't that truly, I mean, as you're talking about the artificial intelligence that we are a little afraid of, which all fear is, it's false evidence appearing real. That's all it is, right? Um, it's easier said, I know, than believing. We all have our, our fear, but your fears, you know, it's kind of like my friend Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa. She's in some ways, we come to earth to learn what we're not. And we have to like understand we aren't our fears by actually facing that fear and actually using what we call friction. It's I use it, I use um the example of a match a lot. You know, a match has everything it needs to light, but it can't do it unless it's struck up against the matchbook. So coming into that friction of the dichotomy, and that's what our planet, that's the beautiful thing about a third density planet, which we are moving out of, but is because it's the planet of choice, because we are we are met with polarities, with di dichotomy within our own self. And part of the liberation of the yoga practice is um, seeing the truth through the illusion. And we were talking, you said something amazing with uh, with Nicole. And I was like, I say this stuff all the time. I use different words than you. But you say we're like, we're an infinite being having a finite situation. Yeah, I say we're, we're an immortal being having a mortal situation, which what better opposing force is that? Than to right. be a limited a body that we we perceive we perceive and i loved how you said that death was just a, a transition because that's the other fear right is that we feel like there's that great alanis morissette song where she says thank you <laughs> Lydia, and she says you know stop believing that death is the end that you don't stop at death like death yeah. is just the body is just is just an experience for this moment and we've been in all sorts of bodies it's the shakti it's the expression of the soul it's not the soul and so and so yeah when we start to realize that all really is one all really is one it all really is one and we, we've been in this delusion of separateness and now we're coming back to that that understanding of all is one and i love it that you're saying like yeah, I was thinking about it. I was actually watching Graham Hancock's series on Netflix with all the cataclysms that happened. And oh, he, yeah, 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 yeah. I love that. <laughs> Bless that man, like him and David Icke. I feel like right now they're like, I told you so. <laughs> they are the ones that were out there being called crazy. And now, but he, and you're right, like all these past cataclysms that had, have happened, Earth got completely destroyed and had to build back up again. But we're seeing it happening simultaneously where one system is breaking down and the other system is and its other system is rising because people are starting to find that liberation of thought that, yeah. that you are the master of your universe yeah i mean and like i said this is and and this is the first time in any civilization where it's happening simultaneously and it's for and it's by design because as you have this controlled implosion, because that's what it is, controlled implosion. And if anyone knows what that is, it's like a construction term. <clears throat> and so with this controlled implosion, that you get to see everything come apart. That way you can allow yourself to bear witness for what is to come, for what is to be built out of this. 
before and even in even in recent years in like in the 70s and 80s when things were just like okay we'll just tear it down you know like whatever system and build something on top of that you know it reminds me of uh this show and other and other shows that one show in particular that's coming to mind is Futurama, this cartoon, to where you had old New York and you had old, old New York. So you have a city built on top of a city and then with that city it was like, oh let's just discard that and build on top of that. So there's like all these different versions of New York underneath this this large uh foundation. And so you can't build on something that has no merit, that doesn't have any substance. And that's what's happening now because everything that's falling down wasn't built on substance. It wasn't built on merit. There was no, there was no honor in that. And so that's why everything is happening at the same time so that we can see how hollow everything was and how greedy or needy or whatever word you want to throw in there in all the words, uh, to be honest, and how it just didn't serve anyone but, you know, those who built on top of it. And so now you, you they're stripping away not everything that was just not the buildings themselves, but also everything that it was built on. So the buildings, the foundation, everything is coming away. And so just like in nature, when you tear away something, you get to see the beauty that's underneath. It isn't like I think about nature too. Like nature just does this on its own. We see like natural fires. We see all sorts of stuff. Well, nature will cleanse yeah. itself. And that. And as you're talking about this, I talk again with yoga. We talk about like the yoga fever, the tapas, the heat, the fire. We see that within our own bodies too. You oh, know, yeah. the, the law of one makes it very clear that sickness uh viruses these are necessary for evolution of consciousness and if you look back in history anytime there's been a huge leap in our own i mean y'all i know don't be i know we we both know that past civilizations were a lot more advanced than we are now so i'm just talking about like where we are now but if we look at like every time there's been a real a real big plague or something after that you have like the industrial revolution or you'll have the renaissance you have this burst of human consciousness that it, that the shakti of that experience starts to show itself and the body will do that too well we see the people on the the dichotomy of this trying to stop viruses trying to stop that from happening because it's necessary to create new patterns like in the body when you are doing a yoga practice and you get yoga fever it's because a new a limitation in your in your mind had dissolved and so that now had to reach reshift your dna makeup in your body and so the body has gets a fever to burn it away so that the new can come in because as Hillis was saying, it was built on a faulty foundation anyway. It was built on a false perceived limitation. And it's so interesting. I'm thinking about children. I don't know if you have children or not, Hillis, but like no. I'm, I'm an aunt. I've got a nephew and two nieces and children are mystifying to me because yeah. they come out at like, and they're like, before they start going to school, before they start to get programmed, they have they're fearless they have no limitations they're nothing but love they have no judgment and the thing that i think is the best is that they know god yeah. they know the source they don't need yeah. someone to come in and say here's a bible or here's here's a torah or here's you know the, the, the whatever torah. yeah yeah they know god and they don't yeah. judge anybody for being a different faith than them because they see the God in everything. They see, I know kids see, I know we're all born seeing spirits and seeing, and then it gets yeah. kind of taken away from us by those, those fault, those faulty foundations of, and that's when you, when you're saying all this too, I'm like kind of laughing in my head because we, as human beings, we get so addicted to the story. Oh yeah. Cause we, the story defines us because that's what we all, that's what we, that's what we have to hold on to is the story because the story identif the story defines us the story <clears throat> helps us to connect with other people the story is the thread of our lives and and what you just said is, is i want to bring up because of this is fascinating and human development and not the story but story that I was told uh, about a month ago and I found it fascinating when, when I learned this is that in the inception of 
Yeah, and I don't believe this was Earth. This was a, this was another planet, and I believe it might have been a group of Arterians, Palladians, Syrians. I think it was like a mixed group of 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 star people. <laughs> um, and so there was an experiment that was two planets, and one planet had a ground team, and this ground team were the overseers. They were the teachers. They were the guides to help the new beings on this planet acclimate to their surroundings, acclimate to what they needed. And then on another planet, none of that. No teachers, no guides. It's like, okay, you guys go do whatever you want to. And so that was the free will. And the ones with the guides and teachers they gave them what they needed. And so the result of this experiment, now now I'm going to ask you, before I give the answer, which planet do you think did better? I'm probably going to guess the free will planet. Yeah. Well, was, yeah, well, because yeah. I, I, I listened to a Joe Rogan podcast once, and it's interesting you talk about this because they were talking about the American experiment. And I, you guys, at this point, I like I said, I don't know. Did my ancestors come over <laughs> on, bo on boats? Who fucking knows at this point? Like, did the Civil War happen? Who knows? I don't know right, anymore. Right. But, um, but let's just pretend that the controller story is a true story. So they have all these people over here in America, and they, they did something that no other country had ever done before. They let the people run the country. And within a short amount of time, our country, the American country, became the strongest, had the most beautiful artist you know, yeah. huge developments because we had no overlords to, right. to keep us in our boxes, you know, right. and, and that, so, so uh, yeah, the free, and that's, that's, ch and that is, that's the children, right? That's like, we see that with, with babies, with toddlers, yeah. Yeah. that can speak and wipe their own ass and they're getting it more than we are. You know? Right. So. And the thing is, the beauty about this is the beauty of this experiment is how earth came to be. Because people talk about how we have such free will. But I want people to truly understand that there's free will, the illusion of free will, the choices that we have from day to day. And the true essence of free will is being, is being self-liberated. Meaning that you are free from fears, personal limits, consciousness, the programming. You're free from all of that. You know, the illusion of free will is I have a hundred thousand dollars in my bank and I can do whatever I want whenever I want. I don't have to answer to no one. And you just go on down that list. And that's the illusion of free will. Yes, it feels good. Yes, it, it, it cultivates the energy of happiness. It cultivates the energy of freedom. But then you also have the choices of responsibility of do I choose to do something benevolent or do I choose to do something malevolent? And so it's also in these choices where the energy of the free, the illusion of free will is cultivated. And then from the illusion of free will comes the actual free will. It's a process, even though we're born free. We're born into this consciousness of freedom until, you know, we're like three, five, and then we're learning from our parents. And I'm like, what happened? How did I get like this? I'm learning this from you. How can I learn? So it's like this whole, this whole cycle. And so when we indoctrinate the kids from our experiences, you're putting limits on them. And so it's this whole process that begins all over again. And not saying that what anyone is doing is, is incorrect. It's just, you know, what, it's just what we know. And this is how every civilization has been. We only learn from what we know. We don't learn from what we trust. We don't learn from our intuition. Now, I know I'm still guilty of it sometimes, too. You know, just because I sit here before you not speak this doesn't mean I don't do it because, heck, it's a process of really stepping into that energy of trust, you know? Absolutely. My friend Tamara from Australia, who um, 
I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's on my channel a lot. She used to be the big chart reader for a lot of like Lionel Richie, a lot of the Hollywood people. And she could, she always says something that's so brilliant because she's, you're echoing things that she says. And we are so disconnected. Like, like again, if you look back at a child, children, if you've ever had a kid around you and you tell that kid to go hug, hug Uncle Jack or whatever, and that kid doesn't want to, they're feeling something in their gut intuition, and then we force them to do it because it's polite, right? So over time, we get disconnected. And Tamar always says, when people ask her, how do I know the difference between my gut feeling and my fear? And she goes, that's simple. Fear makes sense. Sometimes your gut doesn't make sense. Yeah. And you got to learn to trust that. You got to learn that that trusting that even though your logical brain is telling you this is safe, something in your gut is saying something's not right. Yeah, something's exactly. Not right. You know, and I laugh like, you know, I grew up in a upper middle class, very professional family, come from a doc family of doctors. And we were education, education. Edu I mean, I didn't know that university was an option until I was like in it. <laughs> you know, like, I, <laughs> and my parents were like, well, it's not, I thought it was like against the law. Like you had, like you had to go yeah, 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 yeah. like, well, it's, it's your law. You have to go. Um, so, um, but I, I remember growing up, they would talk to us about like five-year plans and I'd be like, I don't even know why I'm here. Like, what are you talking about a five year plan? So yeah. you're, you make, you brought up a good point about money too. And we're seeing this right now because we know our money system is built on a faulty. It's not backed <laughs> by gold. It's not backed by real. It's just, it's just glorified paper, right? We, we know that we, this, we know we still have to use it, but we know this. So I'm looking, I mean, you're talking about, you know, I know that feeling of having financial success and thinking, having almost this, an illusion of security but at any minute that plug could be yeah pulled. yeah you know and and it goes much beyond that in in the space of really understanding what is free will what is freedom you know and i'll be honest you know i did uh plant medicine for and actually i've been doing plant medicine for nine years but my my most profound experience was when I was in upstate New York for a month, five weeks, and I didn't have to worry about money. I didn't have to worry about anything. I didn't have to worry about a thing except me being well, about my happiness. And if I just wanted to go lay in the teepee and get medicine, or if I just wanted to go in my tent and sleep, or if I just wanted to do a, a store run to go get groceries for everybody. It was like just those little things. It's like, I was happy. I mean, it was like, this is what life should be. And, and, and I understand. I mean, you know, we have these communities around the world, but the, the remnants, the, the, the trueness of community is really knowing that everyone is taken care of, knowing that you, <clears throat> you are taken care of first. But when you are taken care of, when you are satisfied, when you are well, then you can take care of everyone else. Yeah. I think that's the trick in all of this. The trick of, in, in all of this is that, well, you know, I'm not my best, or I'm not feeling my best, or I'm not doing well, but I still have responsibilities and things that I have to take care of. And so we run ourselves down fulfilling an obligation that we have been programmed or indoctrined to take care of, <clears throat> even though we're not feeling well, which is why everyone else is making money on those who aren't well. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's like the airplane when they tell you to put your, your oxygen mask on first before you help the person beside you. You have to be at your 100. And I think a lot of parents, I mean, I'm not a parent, but I do think a lot of parents struggle with this too, especially yeah. women, to be a good mom, to, to have that identity of what of what you need to be. To you, You've been taught to self-sacrifice, which... Yeah martyrdom is not is not a good thing you, you we don't want martyrs like we don't we've, we've, had, victims. We, yeah, we, we've had enough of those like we, we, <laughs> we didn't we didn't learn, learn the first ten thousand times we don't need to that's you know we don't need to do that again um right. so yeah it's it is it's interesting because i mean i just keep on thinking that janis joplin saw a song for bobby mcgee freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose and like having that um you know my grandfather 
uh, he pa- he's dead now, but he passed away twice. The first time he had his near death experience and he came back completely changed. Like he didn't fear death anymore. And so oh, when, yeah. when that limitation was gone, he didn't, he was, I can't even explain it. Like the magnetic person that he was, and he became so much more compassionate to other people's needs at the same time. And every time somebody was in the community was on their deathbed, he would go sit with them and like talk them through. I mean, like Ram Dass, one of my favorite spiritual teachers before he passed away himself, he had created, you know, we, we get so excited and, and, and bringing life into the world is obviously a beautiful, exciting thing, but so is the passing of death. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's treated with the same. He has people come meditate when people are on their deathbed because it's, it's a transition. And once that fear is gone, then we lose. I think then we do come into the ultimate freedom of being, you know, we look at people on the streets who are homeless and I've done a lot in my life to try to help that. But sometimes I think, are they the crazy ones or am I, are they really living free? Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, that, that's one thing that I think about from time to time, all the homeless people, but, the thing is what I want to express here is that, you know, I've died many times in my plant medicine experiences. I mean, which is why I am able to sit here and be what is being asked for, be in this conduit, be in this vessel to, to transmit what is being asked to be transmitted. And one of my biggest fears is heights. And so, you know, I went skydiving and, and I talked to the guy. I said, yeah, I have a fear of heights, but I don't think this is going to cure you of your fear of heights. I'm like, oh, well, we'll see. And so the first, when I first jumped out of a plane, that free fall was the scariest moment of my life. That, that whole one minute of free falling out of a plane, 14,000 feet, it was like, why am I doing this? What is happening? Am I this nuts? Am I this crazy? And the spirit was like, no. Remember, you have your parachute. I'm like, oh, yeah. He can pull the parachute. Okay, I'm fine. And so it was in that moment that I allowed myself to just be free and knowing that, yeah, if I die, okay, you know, I'll just come back and come back again. And I see the planet has been transformed. And that's like, I've done my job. Yay. Yeah. Uh, and so. And at least you have a cool death story. I mean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and my mom will be waiting for me and say, why did you do that? But that was my out. <laughs> that was that was one of my outs. Because, you know, honestly. A lot of, I don't know if people are aware of this, watching. I don't know if you are aware of this, but you know, when we choose to incarnate whenever and however we choose to incarnate, there are multiple uh, times in our lives. But what I'm hearing, most of us get up to three, some of us get maybe more that we had, that we, uh, we get it out. If some, if our life is too much, we can abort mission. Yeah, exactly. You know, and so, you know, it's, it's 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 interesting because I'm just getting a little little bit emotional on that because a dear friend of mine, her uh, boyfriend, was in a car accident just the other day. He had to go fund me and raise the money for the the services. And, and the reason why I'm getting emotional because I feel like this may have been his out. You know, because people always talk about walking, say, and oh yeah, oh, I'm a walking, or I'm a walking. I'm like. You know what? Excuse my French. Bullshit on the walk-ins. I mean, I'm not saying that they don't exist. I'm not saying that they don't happen. But when you have a walk-in and you walk into someone else's life because it begin, it's too much for that one soul, I understand that. I have compassion. And the reason why I call bullshit on it in this moment is because the tenacity, the strength, the resiliency that has to exist for one to be in one's true soul power is a lot. And for, and for you to take over someone else's life, that also signifies, yes, your courage, your strength to do that, but also signifies 
someone else's inability, another soul's inability to accept what is occurring. You know what? I'm out. I'm done. So that could have been that. And for that walk-in to have that moment, there should be a space of meeting right. to right. consult, to comfort, to have compassion for that soul. Saying, you know what? I can't do this. I need help. And this is just like how our system is built. The trauma system is built on, well, if it's too much for you, we just throw you in a crazy home or just like you're in prison. I mean, I like uh, what Sweden is doing. You know, they they don't have yeah. prisons. They I have those, those hospitals. They're not hospitals. I can't think of the word that they use. I've seen it. It's brilliant. And it's funny because I don't know if you're familiar with the law of one, but they say that on our planet, because planet Earth, according to them, out of all the third density planets is like the most gangster. Like we take the darkness to a whole new level. Yeah, like, it is. It is. <laughs> and so I just want to, I just want to go back to this before I forget is that, you know, and so when we have the souls and most of the people who have that out are the walk-ins. People say, you know what, why did I sign up to take this person's life? You know, and so the reason why there's suicides, the reason why we have all of this stuff is because there there's a combination of things. You know, people say, oh, well, because that person had an overdose or this person committed suicide or this person, you know, whatever the reason, whatever the, the story is, we and I know some people may disagree or whatever. I don't care because the truth of the matter is the fact that whatever we signed up for, whatever we volunteered for, whatever our purpose or mission is, yeah, it can be too much. Yeah, it can be harsh. Yeah, it can be challenging. Because, but that's the beauty of it is to see the transformation that unfolds in that. Because if people would have known me when I was a kid or if people would have known other people that I met, if, I mean, I'm still pretty much the same, but other people say, how did you get to be this? Or how did you get to be that? You know, and it's through life itself. It's through what being on this gangster planet. <laughs> I mean, because... I've, I've stolen things, I've done things, I've had gotten into fights, the things that are uncharacteristic of me. Yeah, but that's the bit of it. We've all had these things. And the best way to really not even rise above it is to remain, is to step into the energy of being neutral. Just simply observe that. Because when you're able to experience life in this fullness from everything from the lower density fields of the planet and stirring up trouble and causing this and doing that and just just we can have it you know like kids do because we're still the kids of the universe <laughs> but no we're still kids of the universe we can have it it's like oh there goes planet earth again there goes planet Earth. Oh, what are they doing now? Up oh, there goes planet Earth causing havoc in the universe. And it's like, oh, wait, there's a fourth of them, a fourth of the population that's actually really doing something amazing. Let's keep our eye on that fourth of the population and see how they do. Say, oh, wait, planet Earth is coming back into balance. Oh, wait, wonder why that is always that fourth of the population that's really affecting everything else. So when you allow yourself to step into your free will, your freedom of choice, and to exert your power, to control your power, to understand what your power is, and to be the, become the neutral observer of self, you then can be the example for others. And I tell you what, this is true, because when my, a month before my mother died, this was the last conversation I had with her. We made plans for her to come to New York City to do plant medicine, everything. We had a conversation, last conversation. 
my mom finally got who I was just for me being an example of life. And when you step into that energy of exemplifying who you are, being your authentic self, no one will question that. They will just want to know, how did you get there? How did you do that? Because everyone asks me, tell us, how do you remain so calm? Tell us, how do you always remain so centered? It's because I have seen life. It's the it's the great witness. That's what yeah. sutras say to be the witness. That equanimity, um, the Bhagavad Gita. That was one of the most life changing books I ever read. Where light bulb moment, you know, Arjuna is on the battlefield. He's got to go to war, and he doesn't want to. He throws a temper tantrum, and Krishna, who's the avatar of God, comes down, and he's like, "You signed up for this, yeah. up, Buttercup. Like you signed up for this." And they have this yeah. whole conversation. And he says, and Krishna says to Arjuna, let, love the work for the sake of the work, not for the fruits of your labor. Be in that moment of being that witness yeah. of what is happening. And you're yeah. so right. I'm loving this conversation because this is this is the great um, law of one talks about this as well. Like when we decide to come to earth, when we our soul decides to come here to refine itself, we almost like going to university. We have we we decide on certain things. Yeah. That's happen to us in order to create that friction to, to, to yeah. have to descend into that place of hell in our own lives and they laugh at us because our guides and our advisors in the spirit realm are like because we see earth as just such a quick a quick blink of an yeah. eye that yeah. we cram all this stuff in and they're right. like listen you don't need to be mugged 10 times you don't need to go through 20 divorces <laughs> like this is too much, honey. All that needs to happen is one time, two at the most. And if it doesn't happen after that, then okay, all right, let's keep on going. <laughs> and, and so that's the beauty of it because, you know, in this space of remembrance, you know, we have to, we, we have to allow ourselves to remember. And when, and I'm, no, I'm not sorry. When people just started calling this the great awakening, I'm like, do you know how redundant and how silly that sounds? Do you have any idea of how incorrect that is? And, you know, being a minority and a majority of light workers, you know, even that time I'm not a big fan of, but, you know, in that space, we, there are processes that we've signed up for. You know, and one example that I've been using lately is, you know, because one of the things I specialize in is helping people clear their trauma from their lives. And a lot of my clients, majority of my clients, and, and Spirit has said them to me because Spirit knows I can handle it, are clients who have been sexually abused. I just have to give a little bit of framework to this. And so just imagine, and I want everyone to do whatever you're doing in this moment to just relax and take a breath and join me on this quick journey. And so just imagine you are in your soul conference room with your soul family and everyone has their piece of papers, their contracts before them, and each one has a responsibility to another. And each one has I'm responding. I'm your mother. I'm going to bring you into this world. I'm your father. I'm going to create with you. I'm your aunt and grandmother. Will help to nurture you. I'm your sister. I will bring you laughter and joy. I'm your uncle. I'm going to be the one to beat you up and abuse you. And I'm like, what? I can't do this. I can't be the one to bring you pain. That's not in my nature. I can't be responsible for inflicting trauma and pain unto you. You are family to me. How can I, a being of pure light, hurt you? And then you turn to them and say, you have to, you must, for me to remember who I am, for me to remember my power, for me to remember my soul, for me to remember my strength, my courage, my confidence, my conviction, you must. I can't. I will not allow myself to do this to you. You must. And he says, okay. And everyone signs their contracts. 
family, your extended family, everyone who's your soul family. You get to Earth, you have amnesia, no one remembers anything, but you have this energy, this desire, this motivation to inflict harm. And this is not just for abuse, this is for anything. This is, you know, robbing people, killing people, whatever. Be helping other people remember. And when you get here and you experience this great abuse, this great trauma, it's like, how dare you inflict yourself onto me? How dare you impose yourself onto me? How dare you do these things to me? You blame someone else for what was done to you, which is fine. You can blame them because we don't know. We have no idea and why you harmed me. We have no idea why you hit me, touched me, broke me. No idea. But it's in the years later that we come to realize our strength in that moment, that we come to realize our voice in that moment, that our strength and everything, the, uh, that our strength has come from the suffering that we've endured. And this is what makes us strong. This is what makes us unique. We go through life, and sometimes that pain turns into compassion. The pain turns into empathy. And when it comes for our time to transition, we meet with our family, our soul family. And we turn to that person who heard us say, thank you. Thank you for fulfilling your purpose, your obligation to me, to help me remember. And I know it was challenging. I know it was hard. I know it was something you did not want to do. But I thank you for honoring me on my journey, just as I've honored you and yours. And so when we begin to look at that, from that full circle perspective from incarnation to transition, we get to see it all. And not just for this tiny blip that happened. The tiny blip is the event and the blip that follow after the event that has strained us because the event strain us into doing or into taking action or not taking action. It is in these finite moments that allow for the infinite being become much more. So you have to understand that everything is a lesson when we step into the space of being the neutral observer. I, I just, that is beautiful, Hillis, and I agree 100% with you. It is, that is, and it is, it's, it's all, it's all, it's all part of our plan. We didn't come here to like be accountants. I mean, yeah, that might be part of your plan, but like that's not, that wasn't, you're yeah. someone didn't come here to learn how to crunch numbers. Like the, it's, it came here to refine itself. And yeah. I agree with you and the people, I, I was in a narcissistically abusive uh, relationship in my late twenties, early thirties. And I actually almost lost my life one night. I got cho I mean, it was bad, but it put me into trauma therapy. And so that met mixed with my yoga practice. I see now that moment when I almost lost my life was the best thing that ever happened to me. And even mm -hmm. though that person is no longer in my life, I will internally be grateful to him for giving me, for pushing me to that limit um, in Magdalene's gospel that the that the church band, um, she talks about that. You have to descend into hell. You have to in order to ascend. You yeah. can't just ride it easy. You have to go because that is when the friction comes. And it's like that beautiful, you know, that is it Japanese culture where if they break something, it's considered more valuable because they glue it back with gold, yes. Yes, and it's like the more your the more your heart breaks, the more the light can shine through. And I'm I'm hearing like the Quan Yen story. I mean that I've known the Quan Yen story, but when I did the Sophia code and I got to her key code, I literally it took me hours to record that because I was just sobbing my eyes out. We see Quan Yen kind of as being this very meek ascended master, but she went through hell and back in her human form, and that's what brought her. It was her strength that made her compassionate. It, yeah. was her, it was that understanding she, out of all the key codes in the Sophia code, probably went through the most. 
uh, in her human form, something that would break, and it broke her as a human. And it was in her brokenness that she started to heal and started to learn how to find trust again and trusting herself and forgiving herself. And that compassion, that softness is, and I say to other people in my life who've been through hell and back, and they are the most compassionate, trustworthy, non-judgmental humans that you will ever meet because they have, they've seen the devil. They've seen, they, <laughs> oh, what, what do they say? One of my favorite quotes is like, <laughs> a, a religious person is a person who has never seen hell. A spiritual person is a person who's been to hell and back again. You know, like, yeah, they, no, they, no, I can attest to that. And like, you can too. I mean, it's, you know, what I find fascinating about the soul and how, we choose to uh, choose to carry wounds into the next life on our body. I have three physical birthmarks, one of which has been from a previous death where I've died. And the one that is most fascinating to me is I consider the birthmark, but the doctors call it something else, is that I have a hurt room. Well, I have a hole in my heart. And I was stabbed in my heart by a lover. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, a jealous lover stabbing me, and I say, because I'm becoming this well-known prophet, blah, blah, blah. Okay, there goes that life. Another life I was burned at the stake for being a witch or prophet. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, there goes that life. We were probably right there beside <laughs> each other. <laughs> probably. Good to and see then, you again. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have uh, a perfectly a perfect rectangle on my back from a time where I was speared in the back in a war that I was fighting that I probably shouldn't have been. But and then I have another one near on my thigh from another war. So it's like you know what? So I, I have not fought in any wars in recent lives i have not you know had the hand of a jealous lover that well no take that back yes i have <laughs> that's an escape i think that's every life you're like listen i'll learn my lesson with the wars i'm just gonna stay right here with the mushrooms and the ayahuasca but i have one i i remember when i was a child when we first in, in elementary school first studying about vlad the impaler and I and of course what he did was horrific like impaling people but i remember being viscerally upset about that well, yeah. I have a birthmark right in the area where you would have been impaled. And so I don't know if that was a remembrance. Um, I remember being in the fourth grade. It could have been. Very well could have been. Because I had a visceral reaction. And I remember being in the fourth grade and telling my friend all about King Henry VIII and how he chopped all his wife's heads off. How did, an, how did a fourth grade? And my friend still reminds me. I'm still friends with her. I'm 40 now. She still reminds me about that. She's like, that was weird. Like, we have not. I was like, yeah, that was weird. I was probably there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I would, in one life, I would, well, not in one, well, how many lives have I had? I'm like super old. Yeah. And actually, I, I had two lives in Samaria one where I was a slave and one where I was something else. You know, I was a uh, high priestess in Egypt. And I'm and I'm getting my high priestess energies back. So watch out, people. I okay. I'm gonna high five you from the screen. Me too. I'm I'm of the I was of the priestess of Isis. I'm the Order of Magdalene. I was told by our friend Nicole, and I was uh -huh. told by somebody else as well who doesn't know Nicole. I have Hathor's imprint. So right there, I have uh, Toth was mine. Oh yes, so emerald tablets, right? So which is why I am of knowledge <laughs> yeah, i mean the emerald tablets let me tell you that is one of the i just kind of with all these books i go through i just kind of let spirit guide me and i don't ever like it just will p talk about the ai right like so i'll be just on the internet and a book will pop up and it'll just tell me like that's the next one so that's the right. god that's god talking to me that's how i did the missing books of the bible i didn't go seeking which one to do next it would just appear it would just it. pop up and, you know, yeah and that's the thing with me i used to be real heavy into books but like in the last like six years since i've been attuned to this lamorian energy i don't read books anymore i receive information and i feel that you know every now and again i read a blip here or there about something that's really 
you know, concerning and of, of importance. But for the most part, I just receive information when I ask for it. And a good example of that is, you know, uh, and, I, and I think I talked about it on the cold show, is how I get light codes. And there was one time I was watching TV and I was looking at my, and then, you know, and I was, had to start about the elements and how the elements are the only thing that really does that defy all law in the universe. The elements defy all law. Yeah. And so then I went to my book of symbols and I'm looking at my book of symbols. I'm like, these symbols for the elements are old. They're okay. We need something new. The next day, I got the download of the new symbol. So I have access to this library that no one else has access to. That's How did you get that? So it's like, it's, I asked for it. You would be Odin then as well. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a magician for sure. That's, Odin is Odin came to me hardcore like that because he's the same as, as Thoth, the Emerald Tide. Like that's Odin too. So he is, and he is, and I'm not, even though I'm a white girl, I'm not that well versed in like <laughs> gods and goddesses. I have not been doing my homework on my own people. But, but, um, but, but that being said, like, that's the thing, right? All these ascended masters have incarnated in like every culture to right. bring these teaching. So it's, 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 you know, so, so yes, I, I know we're about an hour now. I am, I'm just loving this. I could talk to you all day, Helen. <laughs> and I know we have a lot, I have a really cool audience. I have, and we get some trolls every now. Listen, I've gotten the fundamentalist Christians. I'm going to make a coffee table book because, you know, humor. <laughs> demons can't laugh. Only, so when this is all over, I'm going to make a coffee table book of all the death threats I've gotten from fundamentalist Christians. Because oh, wow. I can only imagine a heck them talking to, you know, and, and me, you know, a black gay spiritualist man. I'm like, that just defies and breaks every fundamentalist Christian rule. Come on. My best friend is gay. Like, I'm, I'm like, well, I don't understand you guys. To love another person is to see the face of God. Like, come on. Like, exactly. Bad people, let's just, this sounds very fundamental, but I think we need to say it again for those in the back who can't hear. Bad people exist in all areas of life. Every, oh, yeah. Oh, every yeah. Every race has bad people. Every religion has bad people. Every set. There are really bad straight people out there. Right. But let me say this you know, what we just talked about. Now, They're their part. Right. Well, ju and just understand that, yeah, they are exactly who they are, what they are, they're playing their part to help us remember who we are and what to get back to. Yeah. I mean, this is where you have to look beyond compassion and step into the role of empathy and to as don as my one of my favorite people on the planet <clears throat> don uh neil donald walsh and how he talks about this story in his latest book uh dang it i can't think of the name of the book and i had him on my show three times i can't remember the name of the freaking book right now um but the story the example that he gives is of a child and his grandfather and the child is reaching for a glass of milk and the child knocks the glass of milk over. And the grandfather looks at the child and the child says, Oh, grandfather, I'm so sorry that I knocked this over, you know, and just went into apologetic mode. And I'm just kind of paraphrasing here. But then when the grandfather looks at the child, he says, I understand. It's okay. You're a child. You do these things. And so it's just in that measure that as children, uh, you know, as the planet is a young planet, as we are children, we do things, we mess up. We, we, we have these, this, these glowing pains. And right now we're at the end of this cycle of glowing pains, you know, because there's, there's a place now, you know, I teach about the law of vibration and the law of attraction and Everything is learned through contrast. And so now we are moving away from learning through contrast, where we're moving into really understanding, you know, what it means to exemplify something and learn through, uh, as children actually learn, is through, by watching, through understanding, by exemplifying and embodying those energies. And so as, as, as children of the, of the planet, as children of Earth, what I say to you now is to step into your energy 
step into that space and become neutral in that. Be free of self-judgment and allow for the energy of self-love to wash over you so that way you can really understand what empathy truly means and be free of the critical judgment of self. Because that's what we mess up the most is by stepping into someone else's expectation but what is self expectations what is our self-worth and when we step into that space of being neutral and trust what we feel then all will be well because it's what it is it's wellness it's love it it's is joy. i it's had <laughs> i had that one moment I, I remember in the grocery store and that's kind of like we say in there's a sanskrit word prativa a flash of illumination that all these little flashes will happen to you and I was standing here in the grocery store and I was standing at the deli aisle. I had gone, I've gotten groceries and it was really crazy busy, big city, lunchtime. And I'm getting my boyfriend a sandwich. And usually that stuff like stresses me out because it's just so many people and it's, you know, busy. I'm standing there, there's these group of construction workers and the ladies working behind the counter. And all of a sudden I had this like presence come over me and all I felt was just intense love. For every person, I don't know who these people are, but I just look at the girl making the sandwich, the construction workers joking around next next to me. And I'm thinking, we all agreed to be here in this moment together in this earth school for whatever reason. And I felt just so much love for these people. It didn't last the rest of the day. And eventually I came back. <laughs> home, but but I just, showed up when you needed it most. Yes. I just went, I just was <laughs> laughing at the construct, like one of the construction workers had a big belly ordered a salad and the guy next to him was making fun of him, you know, and I just laughed. <laughs> I was like laughing at their conversation. And I thought these guys are hysterical, you know, and I'll tell you, I'll end this on a really funny story about my gay friend friend um and i laughed so hard when this happened um and then i want to have you back hillis i'm well first before i tell the story i'm going to ask you two questions i'm gonna put you on the spot okay we do shadow work challenges on my channel we just finished a huge 60 day shadow uh -oh. i'm giving them like a couple months break but i'm going to be working on more would you nicole i'm going to bring nicole on i have katherine edwards do it with me would you want to participate in helping me create that template, putting some of your videos up in the template for people? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel that that is what's emerging right now on the planet is everyone is digging deep and is asking for help. Yes. And, and this is what I do. The shadow I mean, side. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't, because that's where, you know, and, and, and this term just bugged the hell out of me. When people talk about spiritual bypassing, I'm like, oh, you just hit a hot button. Because people who encompass the, the work that we do, there is this space that people don't want to touch. And, you know, touching that space myself, getting my hands dirty. And then when the process is done, they're clean. And I say that because of the transformation, the beauty, because everything grows in the darkness. You have to remember, seeds grow yeah. in the darkness before they come to light. So when we step into the shadow, there's a lot of seeds that have gone unnurtured, gone ignored. And it's the ones that we pick and choose and find that respond to the react to the light are the ones to be nurtured. So, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Well, it'll be a couple months because they just finished 60 days. So I'm, I'm giving them a <laughs> to great. We did a lot of like childhood trauma stuff. Yeah, but I agree with you. It's it that's what and that's what um I think a lot of it's missing in this the new spiritual world is that people are it's not rainbows and butterflies until Oh the, hell no. It's it's devils <laughs> and darkness and like it is I tell my students that AY I'm like, listen, they're gonna you're gonna be walking through some shit. Like that's how the lotus flower gro grows. It grows through the through the mud, right? And 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 um and yeah, and I wanna I want you to come will you come back? 
Will you be a Yeah, always. I, I mean, like I said, I could talk about any and everything. I, know. <laughs> I, I mean, like, we haven't even talked about mushrooms and plant medicine. Come on. I mean, we can do, I, I will do, let's do a whole show. Because I have people, because listen, I'm a huge, everybody watching knows, like, I'm a huge, most of the time I'm microdosing, and people don't understand microdosing, and I've tried to explain, like, there's tripping and then there's microdosing and I'm a huge believer on well, both actually. <laughs> but but for those of us that can't go off, we have to microdosing is great. I I I actually was supposed to go to a 10-day dieta in Peru for ayahuasca right before everything locked down. I'm doing I'm on 6 months now. Of ayahuasca? No, well, now I'm on a different plant medicine, but six months in. Oh wow! And mind you, mind you, this is this is a master teacher where you have to sit in the jungle with. Yes, and, yes. And yep. short story, I mean, this is how spirit works. So a friend of mine recommended that I go to her friend's place in Peru. I mean, we just have stories all day, don't we? I know. Um, I know. And, I'm telling you, we probably Hillis, we have probably been burned at the stake many times together probably <laughs> probably and so my friend's like yes here's my friend in Peru. when you're ready you go do your diet to there and i'm like okay cool and so you know locked down all the stuff money it's like oh whatever you know never happened and so i was like it's time for me to do this day it's a time for me because i was looking for a particular plant mix. and there's only a handful of people that sell it and something and i was guided to go to this one individual that sells it. And I asked her, where did you where do you procure your plant medicine? Not that I want to go and get it, I just want to know. And she said, Oh, I get it from this person. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, that's the person I was supposed to go see in Peru. And so I've been doing this particular master plant teacher for six months. And I was like, you know, and I thought about it really hard. I'm like, you know, doing a diet that would be really amazing in the jungle. However, that's not real life. Or be in the jungle, disconnected from everything, doing my work, everything. And then when I come back, I have to integrate. That's a whole other process. It's like, why don't I just do it here? Because I'm strong enough to do it. I can do it here, integrate, and in the bits and pieces, go on mushroom journeys while I'm doing it. So it's like, yeah, we that'll be that's a whole other show. I'm not yeah, even we'll do, we'll and I actually so for people in the comment section, if you have questions about plant medicine, just be careful the words you type in the comments. We will a answer your questions. But I'm a tr I know in the UK, I don't know if they can talk about it on you, but we can do it in the in America. But yeah, I agree. There are there are workshops. We'll say around here in Atlanta um with that as well they're called workshops for a reason um so i agree with you yeah and i'd be honest with you hillis when i knew we were going to go for 10 days to peru to be in the amazon with a shaman i spent months years going back and forth to india i was more afraid of being in the freaking amazon and it wasn't about the bugs or anything it was literally being stuck in a situation that's out of my comfort zone having yeah. my nervous system stimulated not being able to speak the language and literally, you know, so so you're right. There is beauty in doing it in your own backyard because that is your. And Ram Dass says that too, man. Like Ram Dass, you know, all these people go to India, like white people, like me, and they all of a sudden they're Hindus. And he's like, listen, yo, you you chose to incarnate as a white Jewish man from New York. Like that's your experience. Like don't try if you need if you were going to be Brahmin, you would have you would have you would have you would have come but take the lessons from that culture and incorporate it into the experience that you're supposed to have in this life for whatever reason your soul was like i need to be the jewish boy from new york and, <laughs> for whatever reason, you know so like so I, yeah it's kind of like just yeah i totally yeah anyway but yeah, we can talk yeah. all day i want to talk to you about channeling i want to talk to you about all sorts of stuff and i know we could probably do round tables with Nicole as well. I just want you to keep coming back, Hillis. We haven't even talked about ASEA. Like, I have so many <laughs> questions about... I. Okay, I will end on this, you guys, and you guys will see this next week. In the very first chapter of the Arcturian Anthology, they talk about a liquid that you drink that helps you vibrationally be able to handle being with off-worlders. And I'm reading this stuff, and I'm like... Is this a Sia? <laughs> I'm like, 
<laughs> Which, I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. But I, you know, we can we can go into that because yeah, we can definitely. We could talk about a lot of things. That's I. I kind of see a see as kind of on the lines of plant medicine. It's more subtle than plant medicine, but it's very natural. It works with the body. Um, you know, if we were looking at the Bible, uh, they use the word sorcery, and in Greek, that's pharmakia. So. What's going on about the plant with the plants? Let's I actually, and that's we can talk about the Salem witch trials because I believe that was a part <laughs> of the trying to get. I think all those people that hung in the Salem, wherever that I don't even think it happened. I went, I went to Salem and I was like, nothing happened here. I think that happened right. somewhere else. Um, maybe New right. Orleans, I don't know because, um, I don't know. Anyway, we can talk about this forever, but yeah, <laughs> but anyway, you guys, um, I'm so excited, Hillis. If people want to work with you one on one as a healer, they can contact you through your website, correct? Yes, yes, they can. So, let me share that one last time, guys, before we part here. So, I will have all of this um, down in the description box below so you can contact Hillis. Um, I'm just so I'm just so excited. I mean, I've met you through ASEA, and I just had no idea that you that you were just the special soul that you are and that you are here on this this journey with us this listen either we're super brave or we're super stupid i don't know <laughs> <laughs> there's been many times i've stood outside and been like abort mission <laughs> <laughs> you, these humans are driving me crazy um yeah and I want to go back to another planet, but no, anyway, but we love you guys. And you know, it's, it's all coming. It's all happening. And I'm just, I think there's so many just nuggets of information yet that just kind of shook me today when you spoke, even especially the fact that the destruction and the construction is happening at the same time. Right. It's, and that's amazing. And it is the law of one says that too, that, that this is the first time this has ever happened. And usually when a planet goes through a metamorphosis, like the one planet earth is going through, all the occupants of the planet have to get off. So there has to be a cataclysm that removes life. This is the first time that we have gone through this roller coaster ride with planet Earth as she sheds her skin and creates new one. And I know we can talk about this next time. I know that all of our brothers and sisters and cousins and crazy aunts and uncles and the galactics are tailgating. I've heard that from yeah. multiple people that they're sitting, they're like tailgating with banners up, cheering us on as we take, as we ride, as we take this home. So we love you guys. Go subscribe to Hillis, contact him. I, again, I work with him off screen with the SIA and he is the coolest guy. I just, <laughs> learn today about this whole new level of coolness that i didn't even know it i guess in my mind i thought you were just a corporate guy <laughs> <laughs> that was my old life <laughs> you're like i shed that skin <laughs> um, <laughs> did I know, we probably burned at the stake together multiple lifetimes we're having a family reunion right now so right so anyway guys but we love you guys um hang in there you got this the best is yet to come and and you're doing it so we'll talk to you guys later bye everybody bye